Hi, good evening. I'm Christine Mulkey. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here to the first ever New York Times Food Festival, which I helped to organize with Sam Sifton. Uh, this has been a food festival as big and exciting as New York City itself. We've had food testings, tastings, live cooking demonstrations, and more just down the block in Bryant Park. We've had the nights, we've had seven dinners in 10 of Pete Wells' favorite restaurants, all sold out. And here in the Times Center, we've been having the talks, which is a series of discussions with the most interesting and vital voices in today's food scene. I'd like to give special thanks to our sponsors of the New York Times Food Festival, our presenting sponsor, MasterCard, our major sponsor, Uber Eats, our official wellness sponsor, Yogi Tea, event sponsors, Diageo, Sub-Zero, Wolf and & Cove, and our supporting sponsors, AARP New York City, Badia Spices, Deloitte and & Resi, and our contributing sponsors, Joe Coffee Company and REI. And now, on to our program. The rise of Momofuku and Milk Bar in New York City and beyond is one of the greatest culinary success stories of this century. Chefs David Chang and Christina Tozzi have built empires upon food that is as out there as it is technically obsessive. So they're here today with the New York Times food reporter Julia Moskin to talk about what it takes to get to the top of the food world and stay there. So please welcome Christina, Dave, and Julia to the Times Center. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I promise we will get you home in time for whatever your Sunday night TV is. Um, this is the concluding event of our first New York Times Food Festival, which has been a huge success. It's very exciting. Um, and I hope you guys got to do some other things. And also definitely get some snacks um, outside. And uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on in the basement afterwards as well. So. Um, I've known these people for quite a long time. Um, first of all, well, sorry. I, there's something I've been wanting to say to you in public. Okay. <laughs> oh, Just no. so you know. Um, does the date November 10th, 2004 mean anything to you? That's okay. That's okay. It doesn't. That was the first time you appeared in any work of journalism. Really? And I wrote it. Oh my God. <laughs> it was the first story that the Times had ever done about ramen. It was the idea of like, oh, there's this stuff called ramen and it doesn't come in a package. So that was 15 years ago, right? Wow. Um, when you had opened Momofuku. <laughs> so you owe it all to me. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to get that out of the way. <laughs> For the record. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> On the record, publicly. So, um, you know, you guys have been tremendously successful, both apart and together, which I think is really interesting. So Christina went to work with Dave at Momofuku as the pastry chef. Um, she had already had like the highest possible credentials having studied at the French Culinary Institute, worked at WD50, a super experimental restaurant um, where everyone wanted to work at the time. Um, so I guess what I'm curious about is many things, including how did you know? I mean, you had never even had desserts at Momofuku, so let's just do a little bit of a way back machine thing. So how did that happen, and how did you decide to hire the most amazing candidate? We used to buy desserts. <laughs> we literally used to give away Hershey Kisses or Bodega ice cream sandwiches <laughs> um, in the first year. And, you know, we, <clears throat> the story never gets old in telling because I'm always in awe that I'm still here in this business because if I didn't meet this person, Christina, like I don't know if Momofuku ever happens because uh, we were probably going to be shut down by the New York City Health Department. <laughs> so, um, for many, no, many for, things or for, uh, one thing in particular? No, it was totally above board. There's just one <laughs> cooking technique. So we were a 600 square foot restaurant, very busy, and we needed to condense as much space as possible and I had worked with sous vide before, and I wasn't cooking sous vide, it was for storage. So um, I had it in, in immaculate. It was like a uh, you know, card catalog system, and it was incredibly organized. And then I had no problem when the health inspector came in like 2006, I was like, check it out. It's awesome, right? It's beautiful, we're gonna get a perfect <laughs> score. Let's, and then he was like, you know, it's, it's like I had a weapons of mass destruction. Like just a bacterial yeah. incubator. And it was, <laughs> I mean, didn't, I didn't react in a, in a uh, 
proper way. <laughs> <laughs> when he told me he I had to like pour bleach over all the food yeah. and we couldn't open it was a nightmare and uh, I didn't know what to do so I called Wiley and Wiley's like listen I have someone that can help out and it was Christina Toast mm. who wrote a HACCP plan that New York State still uses today. Really? Yeah. So that is a, what does HACCP stand for? It's like a safe handling of food and keeping hot things hot and cold things cold. Well, Hazard you can analysis and critical control points. There you go. But yeah, it's basically like if there's any point along the journey of anything you're ever gonna eat in any sort of food setting, if there's a point where it could potentially be hazardous to you as the diner, it's a whole, um, flow chart and conversation of it's where it could be dangerous yeah. and what happens to make sure that it isn't. They're called kill steps. And it, that's kill like, the bacteria. And it's a huge yeah. amount of paperwork. That's all <laughs> that's restaurants. A lot of paperwork. It, it yeah. was, uh, we were the first, first restaurant violation, violator in New York City history, New York State history. Don't yeah, it was, it was like the technique <laughs> itself was moving much faster than the health department could wrap their heads around because right. it's a traditionally like European, specifically French technique. And it was happening in these like really exciting moments in kitchens in New York City, but they were so few and far between. And the health department just didn't quite know what standards. And they definitely they didn't expect at a restaurant called Momofuku. And um, I had no intention of have, ever having pastry on our menus or having anything other than just staying in business. And then <laughs> Christina helped us mm -hmm. um, sort of re rehabilitate so you, our image. So you put up with the desserts <laughs> in order to get the HACCP plan. No, no, no. <laughs> it was a process. It is yeah. a lengthy process to get your HACCP plan, to get it approved, because you have to go through step by step for everything you cook at every point um, that you might make a dish yeah. and have it logged in so uh, there's, there's just accountability. And um, it was basically learning a new language and we needed Christina who actually taught herself how to do this. And uh, through that process, every day she came in with baked goods. Uh. <laughs> and I knew that she worked at WD and, and she just wanted some time off to start her own business and, and then recalibrate, right? Yeah. And that's how it all happened when after one day I was like, Wait, Christina, you're good at this. So we brought you on to just help out in any capacity, right? Yeah. Because like we didn't have an, any structure in our office. I always think I'm crazy when I tell this story, so it's really fun to hear you tell it. I'm like, that it did happen exactly that way. There was, was no plan. Literally just like, I need help with the, this health department thing. <laughs> I may or may not have said some really bad things, and I was like, I got it, it's gonna be fine. There's all this paperwork, you're gonna think I'm super annoying, but we'll get through it. And somewhere along the way, it was the same thing of like, it, it was seeing what Dave was doing at Momofuku and also seeing how, how much structure and vision there was and what the food was and what the real, the things you know to be what uh, the pillars of Momofuku even today and they were there, but the system and the process of it just didn't exist because, we didn't no. go to school. No one yeah. teaches you these things. And people mm -hmm. actually, I'm sure, do teach other no. people these things. But we didn't go to school to study these things. And I just loved the idea. My favorite kitchens that I ever worked in were ones that were like grossly understaffed or that were that that I could find pockets where there was opportunity to learn and be more helpful. And I did that at WD50, not because Wiley was like, Can you help us with this? I was just like, I have a day off. What can I what can I do to better myself? Um, and watching what Dave was doing, loving the fact that he would serve an ice cream sandwich to be like, that's really ballsy. Mm -hmm. And also an ice cream and sandwich is, is delicious. really good. <laughs> like, it was unapologetic in all the most wonderful ways. Um, and I just loved the idea that there, the only structure was to like help and go where is, where there is need. So I can imagine the conversation between you guys where you're like, I want a soft serve machine. And you're like, hell yes. And then what? Because <laughs> so there's no kitchen, there's no pastry kitchen, there's no marble for rolling anything. You're not gonna make. It first started crusts. at Noodle Bar. Um, but, you know, this is how this whole relationship happened <laughs> literally, like, piecemeal. Mm -hmm. And it was like, hey, Christina, like, 
why don't you put this dessert on the menu? And that's how it happened. And, and then I just realized how talented she was and how good she was at everything. And that's when I was like, okay, how do I get this talented person to do more? And what I realized with Christina is, she's the kind of person, and I remember very clearly thinking about this, like what, how many years ago? <laughs> she can't, she will get frustrated at, at someone else if they're not like always pushing, right? <laughs> and I was like, she's got more energy than me, so the only thing I can do is make her her own boss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just push her. And that's really what happened. So anytime she's like... I remember like a month or two into doing different stuff at Momofuku, I, I would always try and like turn something into her, be like, here, I did this, or like, here, this is done. And you'd be like, Hur. like, like, like I, oh, in this way of like, sorry, but you're going to have to like raise the bar and be accountable yourself. And that was the single greatest thing that I didn't... <laughs> That's probably not what he meant at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember the saucer other than like, did well, I say yes or no? No, well, the, hilari the hilarious part of this was you were like, I think you had challenged me to come up with dessert for Noodle Bar, and I was like, oh, Lord. Like, there's no space. No one's here. The, no one on that line is interested in their low boys being full of anything except for what their reason <laughs> blast needs are. We got to get people in. We got to get people out the door. There's all these people waiting in line. And, and we agreed on soft serve. And then I was like, a machine. And like, bring to a small business owner that is worried about everything. They're like, I have an idea. Let's buy a piece of equipment. Like, no one's here for like, I have an idea to make dessert. I'll, you just, I just need money from you. <laughs> he was like, mm. Um, and I found one knowing nothing about how to work a soft serve machine on Craigslist and went and picked it up. It was used. I went and picked it up in like Long Island and I put it on my own personal credit card because I was like, all right, this is either going to be the worst mistake or the best decision <laughs> and got it and made it work. And then we realized very quickly that we would just need a new and better machine. So I think I like resold it on Craigslist. But she would and then we got crazy, a new machine. But I would have to do flavors. crazy things. Yeah. So how did you, were there flavors that you did not like? Oh, well, this is one we were <laughs> This is like argument. <laughs> no, uh, there was other arguments, but Barbecue this is one of the best. Barbecue flavored soft serve. <laughs> it was delicious. It sounds good. <laughs> That sounds good. Yeah. I mean, I don't think the yeah, thank you. I think the world was not ready for that. So I, I, and I learned pretty early on. I had to pick my battles, um, and I knew that if I said no, and barbecue was one of the first real battles. If I said no, there was no way you were going to like, like take it off. You just double down on it again and again and again, and and that's how our relationship creatively oh, started. But this is like in and of the being of our relationship because you're like, it, the second I tell you not to do it, you're gonna double down. And then the whole time it's in my head because I can hear him saying it. And I'm like, shit, he's right. I have to prove him wrong while I also know he's right. And I can't prove him wrong. And I know this is the greatest lesson that I'm learning that will serve me every other day of Milk Bar. But right now, I just refuse to admit defeat. But I just love the stubbornness. That's what I admire the most. Because Christina was one of the few people at the time who were like, you're an idiot and you're wrong. And I'm like, Yes, I am. Like, like, tell me, show me what you think works. So there was, um, it was a good tug of war. Right, yeah. and learning that lesson, yeah. I think, has been like your journey to um, being a manager, it seems. <laughs> Slow process of getting And teaching other that. people to do it. Because I heard you're on, um, on your podcast talking to Sam Kang about, um, this is, uh, who's the chef at the, not the newest restaurant. How many restaurants have you opened in like the it's last 18 months? Two, yeah. 24 months has been a lot, but it's our newest one in the South Street Seaport area. Sam <laughs> Kang runs Wyo. Mm -hmm. Wyo. And that um, it sounds like he, his journey was a little bit like this. He was like, look, everyone else is wrong. I'm right. And that's the most important thing. Yeah, I see a lot of myself in Sam. Mm -hmm. And um, you see, the difference with Christina is she was always aware of the situation. And you never had to explain emotional outcomes for you, mm -hmm. right? And I think for myself or someone like Sam, it's a lot to be a manager all at once, right? And as a cook, and we've talked about this numerous times, your job, at least when we started cooking, was your only concern is to be good at cooking. And it's not enough to be a good cook anymore. Mm -hmm. You have to learn how to communicate. You can have the best ideas, have the best technique, but if no one else wants to do it, there's no point. 
Yeah, and if anything, it's like the tools you need to be successful on your way up in the business are you gotta be a good cook. And even more specifically, so that you don't just crumble and burn during service, you have to be really good at the station that you are working at that moment. So the only thing you care at first about is just your mise en place or your station or the orders you're gonna pick up. And all crazy things happen to you depending on where you work for just getting that battle, getting good at fighting that battle every night. And then it gets a little bit bigger and then it gets a little bit bigger, but also like the language you use to be successful in a kitchen is totally different yeah. than the interpersonal skills that it requires to be successful anywhere else, anywhere else. Like talk is cheap in a kitchen. But we're armed, we're not armed. We have more wisdom ever, over these years. And yeah. if I had to deal with the situation with Sam King 12 years ago, I don't know what would have happened. But I just, I can, I'm just trying to be patient, right? And luckily f for us, there was just constant, like, creative tension that was good. Well, some people probably, I mean, I wouldn't say this, but some people might say that, um, was Christina the first woman in your kitchen who you hired? We had, a, we had um, several, but she was the first person that basically looked at her job like an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm going to do this better than you. Okay, but let's get back to just, we're gonna to go to that, but the interpersonal part of it, right. I think, is interesting only because you now work with a huge, you have a huge number of women in your company. Yeah. And you also have a lot of women, but you have a lot of men in your company. Yeah. And it's interesting that even though you, what Christina brought, I think, to Momofuku was a traditionally female ability maybe to listen and to communicate. You both in your separate businesses have kind of reverted to um, the people who are more like you. It's so interesting. <laughs> I would say, <laughs> yeah, we have from like a top HQ level, I think our our ratio is like 77% female in our, in our senior leaders, and then company-wide, we oscillate between 65 and 75%. Um, I, I say it's interesting also because I think sometimes it's almost difficult to work with other really strong-minded women. As a strong-minded woman, I mm -hmm. almost, that's more of a challenge for me than otherwise, and maybe it's because I'm used because my only other example was working with you and there was enough similarity but enough difference that we found a way to navigate it. We're with a bunch of strong women. <laughs> Lord, we be, we'll be talking about it forever. Um, and I don't know, I'm still learning how to communicate with an incredible team of savvy, strong-minded women on some level communicating with men, if we're just being traditional about certain things, I can just be like, dude, I need you to do this. And they'll be like, got it. <laughs> Where with women, it's like, I don't know that I like that idea. I think my idea might be better. And I think we might need to talk. And so that for me, I say interesting because that's my current challenge mm -hmm. and, and one that I'm really proud of. But I wonder, I wonder what it's like for you. Well, every head of our department in our company is run by a woman. Um, and you know we've always looked at this as trying to be a merit-based system, yep. and I think it's it's harder now to see like when you came on board, and I remember being like, wait, and we talk about this. We talked about it on the podcast too. It was like so broy. Yeah. And then you were like, no, no, no. This is not how it goes anymore, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was a it was an important step in us growing up and realizing there were other perspectives that we were missing. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you had come from French kitchens. Yeah. I mean, I doubt there were many women at the Cafe Boulot or Boulet or where you're like most Not of your Not in management team, positions. Most of your team came no. from, yeah. But you have, I mean, you have restaurants now all over the world with many different menus, different, all kinds of different things. And you have a very strict, like, this is what we do. So those are also different challenges in terms of hiring. There just aren't as many women in the culinary arts as there are men. Um, so you still get to really be the boss. And how many of your creative things have come from other people in your company at this point? That's a good question. We should do the math on that. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, 
It's funny because when you say you're the boss, I'm like, you're right. I am the boss because I because my because my challenge is all of these incredible strong-minded people. Um, I think the thing that I've always taken pride in at Milk Bar is the sharing of great ideas. We have something that'll come on the menu um, this fall. It is fall, I guess. November. That's called a Thanksgiving croissant. Ooh. And I relish, I relish in the fact <laughs> that this idea of making compound butter and then laminating it into dough and then rolling it up into a croissant and stuffing it with something crazy that tells the same flavor story was the way that my mind was like, this is how I'm gonna get, this is how we're, we at Milk Bar are gonna get down with a croissant. I relish in the fact that, they, that the Thanksgiving croissant was t completely the brainchild of Zoe Kanan, who's the pastry chef at the Freehand um, Hotel, Simon and the Whale, and at Studio. And that was brought to life in part by Allison Roman, who is amazing One and incredible and a cookbook <laughs> author and a contributor to the Times um, food section often. And that they were like, we have this great idea and we want to bring it to life and being raised by Wiley first and foremost to say, you need to come up with good ideas. That's a, that is an, an integral part of working at his restaurant and it was something I adopted at Milk Bar. And then by Dave who was just like, yeah, man, if you can like dream it, put it on a plate and, and feed it to me and let's see how it goes or put it on a plate and feed it to someone else and let's see how it goes. So I don't know what the ratio is, but I... Um, I relish in the fact that some things were ideas that I brought to the table and are still important parts of Milk Bar, and that Milk Bar belongs to every single person that works at Milk Bar, specifically from a creativity and innovation standpoint. So is there turkey in the croissant? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's roasted turkey. Really? Um, if you haven't had roast, it, I mean, I'm not trying to, pull it's it, so good. We pull it, it's, it soaks up its own juices. With if, if, if you're ever like, you got your chicken, and you got your turkey, and you think it's no one's gonna eat it anymore, pick it and then make it soak up the juice that it was, like really make it soak up like a sponge. It'll soak up a lot more than you think. Gravy, cranberry sauce, and then it's like stuffing scented compound butter. Is there caraway seeds in it too? There's a little bit of caraway. There's so, this one, he's, he's got, he's he's got a food memory. Um, but I think sharing in that is incredible and incredibly important. And it's the same thing if you work at one of the storefronts and you have an amazing idea, like let's hear it come in and so on and so forth. Because I think that's, when I think about inspiration, I'm like it comes from everywhere and it also comes from everyone because uh, if you have an emotion, a, an emotional response attached to a food idea at Milk Bar, we're like, come on in, mm -hmm. let's do this. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can make something of it. And Dave, at this point, I mean, you must not even like be tasting some of the food that's served at some of the Momofuku's like on the other side of the world. What's, what's that like as a creative? I mean, obviously you're both business people, but if I didn't know this before, I would know from this conversation that you're both creatives, what we call, I guess we used to call them artists, but like you're create, <laughs> creatives, but you don't get to be that creative anymore. Um, at least it on the It depends plate. on the day. Yeah? Yeah, it really does. Um, I don't really have a schedule. <laughs> I look mm. at every day, 24 hours out, because it's the good and bad part of my job. There's no like regularity at all. So no one expects you to show up for a shift? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't like, work the line but, anymore, yeah. but you know, last time I didn't expect to work as much as I did when we opened up Major Doma in Los Angeles. Um, and that was, that was incredibly <laughs> intensive. Um, and designing a new menu and stuff that we've never done before. Um, and these other restaurants now, maybe it's more of like a producer role. Um, but you know, we have Paul Carmichael in, in Sydney, Australia, and, He's so way, he's so much better at <laughs> like anything he makes can be better than anything I can make, and that's why he has. It's just different. We have no. You know what? I still have a hard time figuring out how the hell we do anything. <laughs> but eventually, I do taste everything. Mm -hmm. You know, but there's a there, and you know this. That hasn't changed how we come up with something, how we ideate, how we punch it up to make it stronger, how we really force people to critically think something through, how we tell someone think about how much time you spent creating this. Now, did you spend the equal amount of time thinking how much it sucks? You know, and to really make it better and better and and. Sometimes, I don't know how, but I'll figure out how to be in that process. And sometimes I don't even have to anymore because people are doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. They've learned how to. I would also say, I mean, the thing that, that makes me so happy when I see you 
is that I oftentimes see you in the restaurants and you are like hat pulled all the way down like you're like no one sees you there in the best way possible. Everyone sees you. Um, <laughs> everyone knows you're there, but like you think you're invisible, which makes me so happy. But also in the ways in which we talk about like, man, we got to become better communicators. That's such an important part of it that it makes me so happy to see you in the kitchens because even though all those things are true, you still are like, you want to know what? You're trying to like explain to a cook something that's coming up with a dish and you're trying to explain to something and you're like, just I'll go make something and then I'll feed it to you. And that food still is this incredible language, at least with your cooks and your chefs of like, how can you even really explain? You can explain to them the fundamentals of like, I always say like, if you're going to work for Dave, you better be able to prove to him that you care more than him. And that's an unreasonable amount. And when you make a dish, you better be able to like stand up for it beyond a shadow of a doubt and like get in a screaming match. Not that getting in a screaming match is the right thing to do. <laughs> like you have to believe in it so much that when he comes out, you can stand up for it. And I love that sometimes for you, at least through my eyes, that's still in being like, let me make the dish the way I'd make it because tasting it is going to like explain the point you're trying to make. Wow. Thank you. I, 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 <laughs> but like to go back to, to like, again, I don't know if I can articulate this. If I'm not tasting a dish, I'm okay with it in theory because sometimes there's a lot of dishes that we serve at restaurants that I don't like, you know, like I personally may not like, mm -hmm. but I like it because someone believes in it. And you believe in that person. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then if I say no, Can if you I tell say, us an example? like the barbecue, barbecue <laughs> saucers are a good example, right? But that never went on the menu. No, it Oh, did. it went on the menu. Oh, definitely. Oh, oh, three months. Three months. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I've learned that you can't figure oh, out new you. until you learn from mistakes. And mm -hmm. if I end it right there, which I certainly could, then maybe they'll have no desire to think about it and to move it forward. And uh, it's not a bad, it may be a bad dish now, but that bad dish could turn into a great dish down the road, or that bad dish might influence another dish, turn that into a great dish, and it just becomes this, this odyssey. Yeah, yeah. But that's a beautiful thing. No one talks about that in restaurants, especially in a restaurant yeah, It group sounds that like, um, and gets like law school, like where it's like, I'm gonna challenge, it's my job as a teacher to challenge you and make you defend your position. But we're also gonna put it on the menu in the meantime, right? Like most people, it doesn't go on the menu unless it's this, 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 that like this acknowledgement of humanity to everyone else that doesn't work in the kitchen that may be sitting as a diner in the restaurant mm -hmm. of like, it's an invitation to go on a journey, acknowledging that the end of the journey isn't perhaps the night that you you know, signing the check and walking out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want them and to that's think. that's an yeah. And is, you're the same way. I mean, our kitchens are mostly all open except for maybe one or two. And we want someone to put something on the dish because how they leave the restaurant is all you can control, but you can also see their reaction to something. And if you really believe in this dish and they eat it and they're like, meh, and they keep on talking, not good enough, mm -hmm. right? You want, you want someone to eat something and be like, this is, this is, this is, yeah. I don't know what's happening anymore. Yeah, it's did, yeah, what if no one ordered it? That's a good one. Is there, is it half eaten? Is it completely like decimated? Because that's the sort of like, I literally couldn't even use my manners. It was so delicious, I sopped yeah. it all up. And this is what he would do when he'd push me. He was like, really, Toast? Like, how many people ordered barbecue soft serve? And I was like, I don't know, but I'm confident it's a lot because, you know, we make the base every three days. And I went into the POS after three months and was like, we sold one portion. Everyone was getting it as a sample because they were like, I'm so curious. And they'd get it and be like, like mm, I mean, in my mind, they'd no get thing. it and be like, mm, that's good. But that was just the right amount, just one bite. I don't want six ounces of it. Um, but it was at least the That's like, so funny, that really happened. It really happened. I totally forgot. Right? But I was like, we're making base, and one of the people on my team was like, that's because they keep asking it for it as the free sample, but no one actually, like, it doesn't convert. It doesn't convert in, in Oh, you thought you were making terms. it because people were ordering it, yeah. and you were like, yeah, okay, yeah. all right. But I think so one of the things it. that happened, especially when Christina came on board, was we really took a analytical approach to stuff by, by making mistakes and collecting data. And I think one of the best ways for you know, people to be autonomous 
at least in our business, our company, is for them to know like what happened. And the only way they can do it is if they have ownership over it. And yeah, I, could, I, I could have made you not serve barbecue sauce or ice cream, but I think it would have done have hated detrimental. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> I and I mean, part of, a lot of people think like, why does a chef need 12 restaurants? Like it must be about ego or people used to think that. I don't know if they still do, but over the many years that I've been doing this, it's clear that like, you know, if you don't give someone their own restaurant, eventually they're gonna leave and start another restaurant. So either all of the work that you put in was wasted because they don't work for you anymore, or even worse, they might become a competitor, right? So you've really stuck to that. Um, you know, we opened up more restaurants to start, remember, just so we could get healthcare for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, it's never been, and I mean this, uh, I think people think I'm much wealthier than I actually am. Because <laughs> if you ask our board, they're like, they were, this is like a social estate. Like, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't get into this business to line our pockets, right? No. It would be nice if that happens, but it has to be done in a way that is meaningful and, and aligned with a moral compass, right? And um, even when we open up, we're gonna open up a new restaurant in Las Vegas, and I can see like, people like, oh, that's a sellout, you're doing this, this, and this. Well. Maybe that's the last place to do something interesting and cool aligned with providing opportunities, mm -hmm. right? Not just for people to, to, to retain talent, but like we're probably gonna employ 250 people in that restaurant. And that is like, that's exciting, right? And, and creating this universe where people can uh, fulfill themselves creatively and hopefully we can design some system where people can get paid better as well. And most importantly, customers and our, the farmers and artists that we work with. It's just this whole little ecosystem that works. And- um, But I mean, really, farmers and artisans are gonna be supplying Las Vegas? Yeah. We're getting all the <laughs> stuff from um, LA Farmers Market, but seriously, one of the biggest things right now is working with different um, you know, uh, people that raise cattle, and we're, we're trying to figure this out. And if we choose one, it's gonna, fundamental, it's gonna dramatically alter this, this farmer's life. Right, because we're gonna buy a lot. So I feel good about that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, people that are gonna try to do it the right, right way. It's not always that case, but we try. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds incredibly idealistic, but um, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's how we try I mean, to do it. I remember it. back in the day, well, this was probably like post HACCP, maybe post noodle bar soft serve machine, but pre everything else where we would have these like theoretical discussions around like, man, we loved the people, the chefs that we worked for on our way up. And yet something always, something was always missing that sort of not required us to leave, but wherein we met the intersection, we were like, all right, I'm gonna get my notice and go and work for someone else. And it was, there was something about it that was, it was like the lack of opportunity missed with the evolving mindset that was happening in food. And I remember having like the conversation with you and you being like, man, what would happen if no one ever left <laughs> their role here? If we could always find, and, it, and it, it's, it's, it wasn't like growing to your point of like lining your pockets, but like what if we could find a way where what we did was fueled by our team and that our team was fueled by opportunity. And that is, of course, in and of itself, like very, very idealistic, but it's still gutsy as anything I can think of to, to say and then to do your best to try and bring into reality. And it is reflected, I think, in the restaurants. Also, like, what if I had a two-star restaurant that didn't have tablecloths? Right. <laughs> like, what if we didn't do that? What, what if, if you we... go to Vegas and you just get, a, like, a wild, crazy meal of flavors if you're not from New York City or you're not from D.C. Oh, yeah. or L.A.? Sure. That it's something that's different. It looks different than when someone tells you is good food. It's the opulence factor is different. And all of a sudden, you just start to think a little bit differently. I don't think that's a bad, I mean, I look at that and go, that's probably a good, in my mind, that's a good thing. Well, I have a question about, like, 
why, how did you ever look at a layer cake and be like, what if it didn't have frosting on the sides? It was like equal parts self-serving because in pastry school, I was always the person that was like, with like an That's obnoxious right. paper toque and being like, these people are, they're crazy. They're all like fussing over the outside of their cake and it's like, and fussing over the flowers and this, that, or the other. And I just looked at him and was just like, I'm just not, that's never gonna be me. Um, Cause it didn't taste. You it were... had nothing to do with the flavor. Mm -hmm. I, I so appreciated how beautiful it was, but that for me, my, that lives lower on like my value system than like, is it the most delicious thing? And I think more than anything, I was raised in a family where like cake was there for every little occasion, but like it wasn't, of all the things we ever made, cake was never really that delicious. It was exciting because it was what we told, it, it was what connected our emotion to like something big is happening. And, visu and, 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 and visually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then it was like, well, can I go inside and eat, you know, can I go inside and like eat the brownies we made three days ago or like the gooey butter cake squares that someone stashed away. And so it was sort of me saying, I know I want to open this sort of like quirky American style bakery, and I'm pretty sure that means it has to have cake. But coming from this man and this mindset, it was kind of like, what's the cake I can stand behind? And so I knew that it needed to be the most delicious. And I knew that the other part that I would never be able to stand behind was caring about putting all the frosting around the outside and in another way, once I started caring about the flavors and proving that theory out, it was also like, why would you cover it up? Why would you even do that? It just, it made no sense. I forced myself into this vacuum of scrutiny that Dave like drilled into me. And then I was like, why would you even do it? Like, once you strip all those things away and you make yourself stand, you know, upside down, all of a sudden, all the rules that you're taught to follow just don't matter anymore. It's funny, when I think about the, the naked, I never even asked like how they even happened because in my mind, how I, the nostalgia plays out is, it's just who you are, <laughs> right? Like everything that Christina made was just an extension of who she was as a person, right? You don't have to have this perfect, immaculate, frosted cake like everyone else. It can be naked on the side and still be beautiful and delicious, but it's on your own accord. and. I think all the things you made at that time were literally yours. And it was so different than everyone else's. So, I don't know, it's like, that, that's just you. I just felt like huh. that was so radical. Like, you know, your cookies are special and you're, you know, you have, you're like, okay, this is gonna be the cookie and this is gonna be the soft serve and this is gonna be... Um, so you. The pie and then the naked cake came and I was like, what is that's kind of ugly. Like, and, <laughs> and now it's and it kind of is still ugly. If you really oh, look at it, well, if you look at it, oh my it, gosh! So oh. I did this. No, no, I appreciate you saying this because I will get in arguments with my not. I mean, I say arguments, but it's like they'll show me a photo of a layered cake that we're going to use for something. And I'll be like, nope, and mm -hmm. they'll be like, what? And I'll be like, no, it's ugly. You see that? And they're like, can you explain? Can you explain to us <laughs> what, what is it ugly? is that you don't like about it? And I'll be like, that little thing here and that little thing here. It's a very fine. For me, it's a very fine mm -hmm. line between what makes it beautiful and what makes it look sloppy or messy or ugly. But the whole menu was one of my favorite arguments with this one because you were right. I said it without coughing. <laughs> you were right. You were all he, here. He, he, I can't remember, maybe it was like two or three weeks in, he comes in and he's looking and he didn't say anything about the layer of cakes or this or that. He you mean this was the in. first, like, for, you mean at the first freestanding milk bar? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and was just like, your menu's way too big. And I was like, what are you talking about, dude? It's awesome. She had the, she had the deck oven. Oh, God. That was, big, that was our biggest fight. Our biggest fight was over these deck ovens. Because they were too oh my God. big. Huge. You'll yeah. love that I don't remember that. <laughs> too conveniently, I remember arguing about the line, and you were so upset with me that there was a line. And I was like, we're moving as fast as we can. I'm like, who says a line is a bad thing? And you were like, it's terrible. It's death to the business. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but my, for me, the, I did learn the deck oven. That was a good one. <laughs> the menu, I remember you being like, you have so many things on the menu. There's like eight different layer cakes to choose from, let alone 12 different toppings. For, it was like every good idea I had ever had in one place on one menu. Oh. And then I was like, we'd like to take your order and serve it to you in 90 seconds. You know what I mean? <laughs> or whatever it was sort of thing. He was like. Well, without doing that, you don't have your culture today, right? It yeah. was a process of elimination. Yeah. And it was so ovens. hard. <laughs> it was so hard. We had duck ovens, because I was like, it's a bakery. People know a bakery as having bread, and we would do crazy things like um, a blue cheese polenta <laughs> loaf. It was so good, and like New Yorkers are so not here to buy a loaf of bread. Like he's laughing hysterically. Oh yeah. Because the deck oven. Took New Yorkers up, don't like bread. Yeah. That's the reason. Uh, to, yeah, exactly. The, the deck oven took up three quarters of our entire kitchen, and so we'd make the same recipe of everything else in this tiny little mixer over and over and over again. And we only had four spaces for sheet pans in the oven, and so we would just beat our head in that oven. And then the de this giant deck oven. It's like the size of this whole wall. Okay. <laughs> would just be empty. And he'd be like, why don't you bake the cookies in there? I'd be like, I don't like the way they bake in there. I like the way they bake in this oven. And he was, I mean, it was it was definitely a drop down drag out until I was like, fine, you're right. Fine, okay. you're right, fine, you're right, fine, you're right. And, and this really shaped what Milk Bar was and what it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Ugly cakes at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still like Funfetti yeah. is is, but it's just it's interesting it, as as a process to me. Yeah. It's like how did you decide that that was because so much um, of pastry now and so much of what is like on YouTube and Instagram as pastry or sweets is just visual. Like it's yeah. just frosting. Yeah. It's architecture or it's painting. It's messy, um, and you are like, no, that's not gonna be how we do it. Mm -mm. So your packaging is beautiful, but a lot of your work is not, like, it's not pink, it's not red, it's not, you know, Yeah, I'm like, decorated. what are you here for? I'm here because I want it to just, like, I want to be, I want to eat something to a point that it's so delicious, I got so pulled into it and enraptured in it, or it made me feel something so magical that I, like, lost all sense, and then it's gone, and... I mean, we care, of course we care about what stuff looks like, but the packaging part of it was the most interesting part because it's like, how do you communicate that through packaging? Knowing that we're not making something to be visual first, we're making it to pull an emotion out of you of, of deeper substance than just, that looks pretty. Um, and you, that's a very like, probably masculine approach by comparison. <laughs> but that's- You have in the Nagy Kate, that philosophy to me is the same as like, no, I'm not going to have no ice cream, and no, I'm not going to yeah. put a chocolate chip right. cookie on, no matter mm -hmm. how many times I ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just because you asked for it. It's, it, I just, well, one, part of it's like the mentality that I learned very quickly in the Momofuku lens of things, which is, was back in the day, I was like, you got to sell a lot of pork buns or bowls of ramen to pay the rent. And I was like, oh, you gotta sell a lot more cookies, cookies. and mm -hmm. cups of soft serve to pay the rent. And it was, it was a little bit of this like, I know I love nostalgia, but I also know that I will always be competing with nostalgia. And so we can never have a chocolate chip cookie and we'll never have vanilla ice cream. And part of that was like, I, I am of the opinion that like you probably already know where you, your favorite chocolate chip cookie comes from. And my job, I don't ever want my job to be com to compete with that. That is the most like, that is the silliest job. I would not have that job for very long because I would go out of business. But how can I find the like deeper emotion beyond why that's your favorite chocolate chip cookie? And then do something about it and do something that like wakes you up or gets you a little goofy or makes you feel something without competing. But I don't think people under, uh, understand your the power of your analytical mind. Like, it's just like, <laughs> when she's thinking it's about like a problem, it's, 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 it's like a supercomputer. She's just churning and churning and churning until she finds an answer. No, that is really interesting as a, as a yeah. It's um, like knowing too much about the business and then being like, 
none of you are going to make a better oatmeal cookie than my grandma, so why would any bakery exist with an oatmeal cookie? And then it's like, oh, that's my reality. Somebody else's reality might, might be something different, but that makes, right. it just made no sense. So you're like, I'm going to make business. a blueberry corn cookie. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Yeah. And yeah. it's going to be so good. It tastes like. Um, we are going to open up to questions pretty soon. So guys, everybody get ready. There will be some mics. So that was a question I've always wanted to ask you <gasps> about the naked cake. Do you guys have any questions you've always wanted to ask each other? <laughs> Now that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> like this. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, the t off the top of my head, I, I know because we've... When we say we're brother and sister, we literally have been. Um, when we fight, it is... <laughs> just a serious fight. I mean, we really go at it. Uh, we try to hurt each other's feelings. Um, this really happens. It's personal attacks, yeah. Do you think that we could have ever done it any other way? Oh my God, that's a great question. To be honest, I wouldn't want to do it any other way because I think the way that you have gotten through to me and has changed over the years has uh, you've just never given up on getting through to me. And I, can't, I just can't imagine it any other way. I can't imagine it. And of all, like, the hilarity of all that stuff, I'm always like, I, will, you, I just, yeah. I would, never you, you, I would never have it any other way, I don't think. And I say, we say all that and laugh, and I'm like, and I, I have your back unconditionally forever Likewise. and ever and ever. We're Israel family. Yeah. Um, and... We've both gotten better at communicating. Yeah, and we're still working. <laughs> yeah, we're still working on it. And yet there's plenty of room to go. Yeah. Would you, okay, so here's, okay. Oh, that's, that's a really good question. And if you have a question for them, you can line up <laughs> at the mics. We'll just mm. call on people in order. It's been a lot, Toast. I know. It's crazy how many years it's been. We very rarely like reflect like this, so it's weird to do it on stage. Ever. Why would, like, I know. No one sits you down. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. What's been your favorite memory? You know what's interesting is to see the alumni, right? Like, you know, when I meet, when I see what James Mark, James Mark, who has a couple award-winning restaurants in Providence, work for Christina, work for me, and I see people that work for us doing great things, and now he's teaching us, right? Like, it, it's, it, that to me is the best part, is to see this, like, spread out away from Momo. That is really cool when you think about all the restaurants and the opportunity, how many people were in the walls of it that were entrepreneurs themselves, that are going, I think that's one thing we never even conceived of way back when, when we had that conversation of like, and then what if they went out and started their own <laughs> things and started doing this? Because every day we felt like it was going to end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? we've had those, yeah. I still feel that way. I don't know if you do it. <laughs> I remember a conversation like, is today the day? I was like, it might be today. <laughs> Hopefully it's tomorrow. <laughs> it was not the day. Not today. What do we say to death? <laughs> um, okay, we're just going to go by turn, and you got to the mic first. Oh, thanks. Hi, thank you so much for the candid conversation. Huge fan, very nervous. Um, <laughs> first, my friend Christina is here and loves you and brought, you, brought your book and would love to get it signed if there's any possibility. That would be awesome. Um, but the question that I wanted to ask you both is you've scaled your business so significantly. Um, what are kind of like the biggest mistakes that you've made through that process that like taught you something? really meaningful like what are some of those like really funny or interesting tragedies that you've experienced that it does exist? and that's for Christina for both this, no they can't both answer all the questions you got to choose <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> you go <laughs> what's the watch out is that the question yeah we'll pretend that it was I don't know. We're scaling yeah I think that <sighs> I would say that my, that my biggest challenge in scaling, not necessarily my biggest failure, but my biggest personal challenge was understanding when and why, and then also making sure that 
once you get to that point, there, at that point, you've probably allowed so many opinions into your head because you can't do it all yourself. You got, you got to start reaching out and understanding what's possible is remembering not to lose your own voice and what you think is right for your business in the process. And that doesn't mean that can't change and evolve when you have someone that has a lot of opinions uh, about anything and everything, but it, I found that it was very easy, very quickly, when you're taking meetings with people that have the money that you might think you need that you don't have, 101 people are gonna tell you 101 things about scale and what it means, this, that, or the other. And what I found, my biggest, was like, you're trying to, you don't understand the beauty of this thing that it is, and that that is, I found, I found, not the hard way, but I found, I would have preferred to find it sooner, that that, that intuition was right, um, irregardless of any other decision you make. That makes sense. Yeah. Next question. Hi, um, just want to say what a big fan of like both you and my questions from like Mr. Chang about having such a large like um, food like you know empire gets thrown around. How do you um, try to maintain your level of quality and standards from like service and the quality of the food, even though you have such a vast amount of restaurants? Like, what's your process like for that? Um, thanks for that question. I I think we ask ourselves that every day. How do we ensure quality? Um, and I don't, I'm a pessimist, I guess, at heart. And <laughs> what I try to instill to everyone is people don't eat awards. They don't eat reviews. You're, you know, you're really as good as your last dish. And the worst thing is inherited success. And I think that as a company, that's what we fight. Um, you know, we have people, we've been around 15 plus years and there's, we have great people that work for us, but a lot of times they don't know why you know, we're lucky enough to be busy. And I think it's our job to, to make sure that if our, you know, Bill Walsh, the coach, used to say the score takes care of itself, right? So our, if we can make sure that we can communicate why we do what we do, then we'll make more right decisions than wrong, especially in how a customer might eat something. So, um, but nothing eats at me more when someone, or we get a complaint, or someone doesn't have a good meal because we, you know, our, our, we want to be perfect. And that's the crappiest thing about scale too, right? Is you're going to have mistakes and it's a lot easier to control that at a smaller level. And you know, this, we're, this is a work in progress. Uh, you know, you're talking to two people that literally are still figuring it out. Yes. <laughs> so Christina, um, you seem to, never tire of trusting your own creative vision and that extension of yourself and putting it out there over and over again throughout your journey. I find that really impressive and brave. Have you ever felt any kind of <laughs> imposter syndrome? <laughs> um, thank you for the compliment. Do I feel imposter syndrome? No. Um, but I find that I have more dialogue with myself around how to allow for all of the voices in the room in, at Milk Bar and find a diplomatic way so that everyone else feels the same kind of courage that like Dave allowed for space for me, while also acknowledging that we have to make a decision, otherwise we're never gonna move forward, nothing new will ever go on the menu and so on. Um, I find that that's more of a challenge and that is, that's tricky. I think at Milk Bar, I tried before imposter syndrome was even like a thing, which is like, we don't, we don't talk about trends. We don't do any of that stuff. It's like we're horses with blinders on. I don't want to know what you just ate at some bakery or on someone's <laughs> restaurant menu. I do if you were excited about it, but I don't in the context of what we want to create next. Um, but it's more about how, how to maintain my own opinion while also wanting to hear and welcome in everyone else's opinion and allow for that same space because it's a powerful thing. Thank you. Thanks. You're up. Thank you so much for such a great, honest conversation. So great to listen to you guys. Um, I had a very fun question, which is what is your last meal? If you had one or dreamed of one or I'd love to know. <laughs> <laughs> It can be like two course. 
Oh, three. Oh. <laughs> well, two courses, that's hard. Man. Barbecue soft serve. <laughs> Barbecue Sunday. <laughs> I don't know. I've thought about this a lot more and more, and now I keep on thinking it's something my mom would make, right? Because she's such a good cook, and she will never give me any recipes. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> Mama. You're up. Okay. Hi. Hi. Hello. I'm a big fan of both of you. I've pretty much been cooking my whole life, so my question is... What advice would you have, David, for someone who wants to open up a restaurant? No. <laughs> uh, um, man, I'm trying to figure out how to say this in a... <laughs> <laughs> the hardest Thir question. Thir yeah. Thir yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very uh, hard business. Yeah. This is going to sound crazy, but if you love it, you have to pour yourself into it. And you're talking to, like when I see Tosi, I see someone that is inspirational because when there's an obstacle, she's always like, how do I get around this? Or how do I remove this obstacle? And the people that always inspire me, not just in, in opening a restaurant, right? Should you choose to do anything else? They're people that just have the, the ability to break themselves put themselves back together and do it day in, day out. And this is gonna sound crazy, but I've, I think like, a, like the suffering that goes into opening a restaurant has to be aspirational, mm -hmm. right? That sounds crazy, I know. But <laughs> if you can find that, then, then you're gonna do what you love, right? And the restaurant business is 99% of the time incredibly dumb. But it's that 1% when you get to do something amazing, great dish that someone else makes, and then it changes the, the, the restaurant. Like everything just, when it's good, it's so good, <laughs> right? And that's what makes up for it. So um, wish you the best, <laughs> right? Whatever we can do to help, well let us know. Put, well put, well <laughs> put. Oh, okay, oh. you too. <laughs> Um, I'm Ben, just like her, I've been cooking my whole life, and um, I want to also open a restaurant, and I was going to ask Christina, what as you you're done, growing Dave? and cre <laughs> creating, <laughs> creating more locations, how do you continue to um, keep your quality high and make everybody that walks in still feel special to be there? Oh, sweet Ben. Hi. <laughs> These are hard questions. I know. They're great questions because they really shoot to the center of it. Ben, it's so hard. Like Dave was saying, like even when you open, even once it's open, it's like 99% pain for 1% being like, we got it right. It was delicious and we made someone feel amazing. Um, we spend a lot of time asking ourselves who we are. When I say like, oh, imposter syndrome isn't really our thing, it's not because we don't agonize over like, who are we? And do people think we're like only nice and happy all the time? And do they think we get like 10 hours of sleep a night? And, and, and. <laughs> um, and we're constantly going like, well, what is, who are we and what do we want to do? And oftentimes, I'll ask the question like, are we excited to do it? Because if we're not excited to do it, one, we just shouldn't do it. We shouldn't be talking about it. We shouldn't be thinking about it just because it might be a good opportunity. And so whether it's like opening a new store or it's doing something online when we're like, I'm like, I want to ship, we ship online because I'm like, I'm raised by a mom who's still, I'm almost 40, will still send me a care package in the mail. They're great care packages. So yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, I don't want to be in an e-com business. I want to be in a business of making care packages because that gets me excited and I know what it feels like to do that. And if we can get excited about what we do, then we've got to be able to figure out like, how do we make it fresh and delicious? And how do we make people feel something even though people are inherently very complicated? <laughs> and we spend a lot of time trying to strip down the business part of the business to like the core and the realities of who we are and what we want to show up every day and work really hard doing. Um, and that makes it difficult, but that also is what makes it worth it. So that even if you do choose um, something that is, is not as um, 
profitable from a business standpoint, it's still something that you're excited about doing every day. And I just think you win that. You're always going to win that that way. And to add to both your questions, I think it's really, really important. Do you have something to say, right? And do you believe in something enough where the customer like, will also see that? That's so important. True. Um, we have time for one more question. I'm sorry, you guys, we're not going to get to you today. Sorry. Hi, my name is Renee. First, I just wanted to thank you for your authenticity today. Um, my question is, when you started your career, I don't know who this is for, but when you started your careers, what did you envision was the pinnacle of your success? Have you achieved that? Um, and if so, then what is your next vision look like? Um, and if not, <laughs> that then what like is that pinnacle of success? <laughs> like, how do, what is that vision you have in your head when you start your career? Um, and is it what you thought it was and have you achieved it? I just wanted to stay in business. <laughs> that still, no, still no, seems no. to be the, the, the same goal, right? And, and to, to make great food and to provide opportunity for people, I don't think that's ever really changed. Mm. Mine was like, make dessert and then figure it out. Like a, in a one day at a time thing, but you, we're the only reason we're like still standing is because we're crazy enough to be like, don't think that far ahead. I think that ha if we're talking about like what is the secret, there's a few of them. I like that have something to say. That's true, but it's also like it's one day at a time, and it's okay to ask is today the day, <laughs> um, and to make like you got to make things funny to keep them real. I feel bad. Can they can they answer? Well, they can't all, but some of them can. Okay. Um, who was first? Oh who was first? You were first. Um, I have a question about investment. Um, recently, Stephen Ross was discovered to have certain uh, values that don't align with yours. So, uh, moving forward, how are you going to ensure that your investors who align with what you guys are trying to do, but also like the you are at the same time, it's not a, extremely profitable for business? Uh, so, you're still trying to make sure that your workers are paid a livable wages and you have health insurance. Well, we're living in a new world right now. I think uh, we all have to ask questions that we never really had to ask before, even though we did before that investment took place. And um, I don't have a right answer for you. I'll be honest. It's, in, it's been incredibly tough and difficult, and I know it's been the same for Christina, to find that. Because if you find someone that, that does believe in you, we still have to now... Not that it's ever changed, and that's what I want to like explain. Our parameters for bringing on investment have never been like like it hasn't changed. It's always been pretty strict. Do they believe in us, and do we believe in them as a partner? And um, without getting too deep into it, um, it's a work in progress, right? And um, I don't have a good answer for you today on that. That's fair. We should have not answered anymore. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you can do anything, obviously. I don't feel that's the case. I don't feel we can do anything. And I, I know I don't want to speak on your behalf. I mean, from working with and for him um, for many years and then having him as my soundboard. So when the news comes out that we're like, what? We're on the phone and, and, and having deep discussions. But as it relates to your question, this man will, every decision that he makes, he makes, he pines over it and toils over it more than you could ever possibly imagine. It could be the smallest decision in the world, but if it's meaningful and it's gonna reach people and have anything that's tied to him a part of it. Um, it it's, it's not parameters you can write on paper. I mean, some are, and then the rest is him like toiling over in his gut. Like, I can see what's good about it. I can see what's bad about it. And what, like, what inside me 
what does that voice tell me to do? And I think that's a parameter that's impossible to actually describe or define. I only say that because I've seen him go through it and I'm not even in, you know. I think this is just as, an, as an observer of the industry, what I would say for both of them is that it is not always possible, especially the things that make you a great cook are not necessarily the things that make you a great business person. And so there's always a huge learning curve, even for people who've been doing it for as long as they do. You don't always know exactly who your investors are. You don't know their political leanings. So that's the kind of research and learning that is a process. So we're going to take your question, and then we are really done. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, well, no, I mean, it's not just about schedule. Like, I would, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to, to make the team better or to make the end result better. Um, I'm, I'm sitting next to someone that has the most insane work ethic. Uh, no, one, no one works harder and still finds time to go running and that be a good daughter and, and wife and <laughs> friend and all these things. But like she has always been someone that like works incredibly hard. And what makes, I can't speak for any other business, but the people that I admire in this business, they will never have an excuse that hard work was the reason that they failed. Mm. Right? And the problem is, and there's a lot of reckoning in terms of how this business and work-life balance is, is like now that I'm a, a father at the age of 41, 42, it's like, hey, is it responsible for me to still work like a lunatic? And more importantly, I don't think that's a good role model for my employees. So I'm trying to figure that out too. This is, ser seriously, without speaking for both of us, it's a work in progress. But you just gotta work like a crazy person. Yeah, you have to learn to have very little yeah. sleep. That's yeah. really the main thing. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Please thank our guests. Thank you. Thank you.